David, you have this concept of explanation, which is a normal sounding word, but you use it to really probe not just the fundamental uh, aspects of reality, but where humanity can go in the future. It's a very powerful part of your philosophy. So I'd like to understand what you mean by explanation. An explanation is a statement of what is there uh, in reality and how it works and why, basically. But the important distinction is between a good explanation and a bad explanation because uh, explanations are to a penny, but good explanations are extremely hard to come by and this is what the growth of knowledge is actually about. So um, a good explanation is one that is hard to vary while still explaining what it purports to explain. So uh, shall I give an example? Sure. Um, uh, suppose you're trying to, you, so you're watching a conjuring trick and you're trying to explain what's happening. Now, um, a bad, an example of a bad explanation would be, well, it's actually magic. <laughs> and the reason that that's a bad explanation is that you could apply that same explanation to absolutely anything, including to the conjuring trick happening a different way or to a conjuring trick not happening or, uh, and so on. So those, those, that claim about reality that it really is magic is not actually an explanation, or if you like, it's a bad explanation. Oh, uh, yes, and another example of a bad explanation, uh, just to show you that a bad explanation doesn't necessarily have to be false, mm. it it's just may be completely inadequate, is to say, well, the conjurer did something. Um, so <laughs> th um, that may uh, be enlightening for a person who believes in magic to, <laughs> to, to tell them that, that, in fact, it was the conjurer that did it, but it doesn't explain the trick. And if we uh, take uh, by analogy with um, uh, the, the laws of physics and, and trying to explain things in a natural world, we could say, uh, what is the origin of species? What, what, what is the origin of adaptations in the biological world? You could say, well, it's just caused by atoms. Here. <laughs> now, that's true enough, but it doesn't explain. The explanation is Darwin's theory of evolution, or rather the modern neo-Darwinist theory, uh, theory of evolution. So you've now differentiated good explanations from bad explanations. Um, how does this apply? For example, explanations in science normally have a reductionist approach, which says that in order to explain what's on higher levels, like we're human beings, you have to understand uh, a system systematic organs, and the, to understand the organs, you have to understand cellular structure, and go cellular structure, biochemistry, and then physical chemistry, and down to physics, and fundamental physics, and now you have a complete explanation. Yes. This reductionism uh, is a prejudice. It's, it's uh, historically understandable because the physical sciences, and especially physics, were the ones that developed fastest. And it so happens that the best explanations in physics are, have been, at any rate, from the ground up, from space and time, elementary particles, that kind of thing. But it's never been the case, even within physics, let alone in other sciences, that all good explanations are reductionist. Uh, and in fact, my basic principle, if you like, that we should be looking for good explanations, which I think is the foundation of scientific rationality, implies that we must not have that prejudice because if we do find an explanation that's on a higher level of emergence, say, and we find a fundamental law at the higher level of emergence and it's a good explanation, then it's simply irrational to reject it just because it doesn't have the form which historically we have been taught uh, is, the, is the one we should pursue. So by really understanding the deep power of explanation, you become more open to different modes of explanation? That is exactly right. And uh, I think with deep explanations, it's nearly always the case that when somebody finds a new and much deeper theory, it's not only a better explanation that they found, it's also a better mode of explanation. So, for example, in physics, uh, Einstein's uh, explanation of gravity in terms of curved space-time mm -hmm. 
was not just a new explanation of gravity. That would have been something like, like Newton's laws, but instead of an inverse square law, <laughs> an inverse 2.003 or something <laughs> law. Uh, it's, it's not like that. It's a different kind of explanation. It's saying that space and time aren't, which, which in Newton's theory are immutable background entities mm -hmm. that aren't part of the theory, become, in Einstein's theory, dynamical objects which buck and weave and explain all sorts of things in, uh, 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 apart from just the motion of planets. What I like about your approach to bad explanations uh, is that they're not only false, but they disturb your ability to even make progress or to find out what are good explanations. Uh, actually, that, that, that definition is what I call bad philosophy. Okay. So bad philosophy it's is... It's a subset of bad explanation. Yes, it, it is a subset of bad okay, explanation. Okay, so yes, tell so me about bad philosophy. So bad philosophy is... is a, false philosophy is not harmful. Uh, in fact, error is the standard state of uh, human knowledge. Right. That we we can, can expect to find error everywhere, including in the theories that we think are, are, are we, that we most cherish as true. But there has grown up, especially since the Enlightenment, ironically, since, <laughs> since good explanations have begun to take over, bad explanations have become worse, and bad philosophy has um, dominated the field of philosophy for many decades. Bad philosophy is philosophy whose effect is to close off the growth of knowledge in that field. So it's, it's the kind of thing that says not just so-and-so is true when in fact it is, is false, but you mustn't think about so-and-so. Or it's bad to investigate so and so. What's an example? Uh, logical positivism. Logical positivism is is uh, a prime example of a bad philosophy, which restricts your ability to even address questions as meaningless because it's not either sense data or logic or something like that. Exactly right. So it's saying that trying to trying to um, uh, understand what the physics is of unobserved objects is unscientific, according to positivism. Now that means really that it, it's trying to reduce us to an anthropocentric worldview rather like the medieval <laughs> worldview because it's saying that the only things that are um, uh, worthy of study are human experiences but of course human experiences are themselves to be understood in terms of unexperienced things like neurons mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so the whole philosophy collapses and it uh, in addition it declares itself to be meaningless because this distinction that it draws applies to itself as well and rules out positivism as a worthy thing of worthy subject of study. What are other examples of bad philosophy? The, um, the ones that are closest to my mind are the ones that have impinged on physics. So um, the um, positivism, logical positivism was one example of that. But um, when... Uh, in, in recent times, uh, statistical analysis of, um, of experimental results has started to use terminology that assumes that certain things will never be worth studying. So, for example, the very term explanation has come to mean a mathematical formula. Mm. They, they say... Uh, a mathematical formula explains the results. <laughs> but since the results are anthropocentric and they are not reality, they're, they're just a tiny sliver of reality through which we are trying to understand the unobserved reality, this idea that, um, that a formula is an explanation prevents real explanations from being discovered. They are ruled illegitimate. So it's almost uh, uh, a, not, not just circular reasoning, but it confines you within, a, within an area that you're, you're unable to get out of. Yes. Okay, so uh, what is the antidote? Uh, I think that all progress, uh, historically and today, comes from the quest for good explanations. That is, explanations that are hard to vary without, uh, while still um, accounting for what they purport to account for. This principle, one of the reasons I like this principle, is that not only does it explain um, uh, what the criterion for success is in science, where it leads to things like the principle of testability of theories, because a test uh, constrains 
the explanation so that it's hard to vary. But it also applies outside physics uh, in, in philosophy, in epistemology, in metaphysics, and so on. The same thing applies. And even beyond that, in political philosophy, moral philosophy, and aesthetics, the same principle applies everywhere and draws a distinction between ideas that have a chance of making progress and ideas that have no chance of making progress. <laughs>